Are you financially prepared for a natural disaster or a local disaster or a personal disaster? Well, if you're not, or if you maybe think you could be better prepared, we've got three tips that'll help you to get better prepared, feel more in control, and be financially ready to handle any sort of disaster. Granted, you still have to have the finances to do it, but the strategies will help you to do that. So stay tuned and we will talk about it right now. Hey everybody, I'm Casey. Welcome back to Cascadia Dispatch, prepping for non-preppers. We put out new videos every week, so go ahead, before we get into it, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, so you will be alerted to all of our new content that's coming up. This is National Preparedness Month. Dun, dun, dun. And we've got four videos planned this month. The first one, which is this one, we're going to talk about the finances of disaster, or preparing your finances for a disaster, or thinking about your finances in a disaster. So everyone's financial situation is different. I've got three tips to help you guys think about finances around a disaster, things you may or may not have thought about, ways to kind of help you, you know, thrive after the disaster as opposed to just trying to survive for the whole thrive versus survive idea. Someone should probably make that a bumper sticker. I think it's already a bumper sticker. If not, someone should make it a bumper sticker. Um, I'm not going to make it a bumper sticker, but someone should make it a bumper sticker. Tip number one, cash is king. Unless, of course, it's a global economic disaster, in which case, cash doesn't mean anything. But we're going to put that to the side, and we're going to assume that we're talking about a regionalized natural disaster or a local personal issue that you're trying to deal. Most of us have become really, really accustomed to using gift cards and debit cards and credit cards and phone payments, and so we don't often think to have cash on us. And there are big disasters and little disasters where having cash with you is going to just kind of make life easier, help you to get to the place that you're going or obtain the supplies that you're trying to get. And it definitely is just going to make life easier. So when I think about where I keep cash and how much cash, it's really situational and it, it is very similar to how I think about gear and how much gear and where I store it. So I keep the least amount of cash on my person with me during the day because I usually am not running into a lot of situations where I need to have cash with me during the day. I also keep more cash with me in my car. So if I run into a situation where I would need cash and I run out of it on my person, I can always go to my car and get more cash. I think about the amount of cash that I keep in my car as it relates to the types of things that I would need for my car. So full tank of gas, maybe it's a tow truck, maybe it's a flat tire, maybe it's snacks for the kids in the car while we're getting a flat tire change. That's kind of the rough amount of money that I'm thinking about. And every area is different and, and you may think about it differently. So it's not about keep $50 in your car, keep $100 in your car, keep $200 in your car. It's just keep some cash in your car that would allow you to do the things that you might need to do in an emergency when you don't have access to a credit card or a debit card or a phone signal to do a phone payment or something like that. Likely you'll want to keep the bulk of whatever cash you want to have on hand at home. And I would recommend that you keep it at home, but keep it in multiple places. Don't just kind of keep it all in one drawer or keep it all in one safe. The cash that we have at our house is spread out in multiple locations just for security purposes. And in case something were to happen in a disaster, let's say, something were to a wall were to collapse and we weren't able to access a room where we had cash, we would have cash in another room that maybe wasn't as damaged. So that's kind of how we think about preps in general and definitely how you want to think about cash. The amount of cash is definitely going to vary depending on what you're wanting to do. So you may, if you're planning on like a job loss or something, you might keep a month's rent or two months rent or a mortgage payment's worth at your house in case for some reason you're not able to access finances uh, any other way, you would have the cash available to you. Some people are going to think about it just from a supply perspective of making sure that they have cash to purchase supplies in case of an emergency. Maybe they need to buy water or they want to trade and barter because we're assuming that the economic system outside and around the rest of the United States is active, then money still has value and people will do this. Granted, there will be price gouging and all that sort of stuff, which is not great. It's just going to probably happen in the short term. But going forward, you'll at least be able to buy and that, that money will have value and you'll be able to get supplies that you don't have 
uh, to start with. The other thing you probably want to think about is if you're planning on evacuating, you may want to have enough cash to pay for a hotel room or groceries when you get to wherever you are evacuating to. Your credit card might be damaged, your phone might be damaged, so those electronic means that you would have may or may not work by the time you get there. So having the cash on hand is going to help you to be able to cover those expenses until you can kind of get your feet under you and figure out your next steps and plan. Tip number two is disaster insurance. So a lot of us probably have homeowners insurance if we are homeowners or you have renters insurance if you're a tenant or a renter. And those are all great, but they don't cover things like hurricanes and floods and earthquakes. So a standard homeowners insurance policy, and I'm going to use mine as an example, covers damage from fires, covers general liability, but if there's anything to do with water or if there's anything to do with a natural disaster like an earthquake, our insurance plan won't cover any of that damage. So if an earthquake happened or if we had a pipe leak and it flooded you know, the downstairs of our house, all of that damage would have to be paid by us. The insurance company is not going to help us with that. Since we live in Oregon and it is prone to earthquakes, we have earthquake insurance. If we lived somewhere that was prone to hurricanes, we would probably try to find hurricane insurance. If we lived in coastal areas that were prone to flooding, we would have flood insurance. These sorts of disaster insurances uh, work very similarly to any other type of insurance, but they cover specifically those disasters. So while your homeowner's insurance isn't gonna kick in, if an earthquake happens or a flood happens, that policy will kick in to provide you with the finances to recover. All of these policies will likely have a deductible just like your homeowner's policy does if there was a fire or something like that. So you can get different deductibles and there are different premiums. Again, this is something you should speak with an insurance person about, but the important thing is to know that likely your standard homeowner's policy will not cover these sorts of disasters and it is worth looking into to see if it's something that you can afford because if you can't afford it, it might mean the difference between you kind of being able to rebuild or having to start over again from scratch or beyond scratch because you're having to crawl out of the hole that the earthquake or the flood created. In addition to providing you money to repair damages and structural issues that resulted from whatever the disaster was, most disaster policies will also give you some living expense money. It may not cover things like groceries or things like that. Again, I tell you every policy is different but it will at least give you the living expenses to find another place to live. Our policy specifically gives us 12 months worth of essentially rent payments to find or go somewhere else and live for 12 months while we figure out what's happening with our house. What's great about that is in that disaster moment, we know that we can go find somewhere to be safe, that will be covered, and then we can kind of take that time to reassess, figure out what we need to do, figure out what the, the state of our house and our region are, if we are going to move, if we're going to stay and rebuild, but we have time to do that without having to worry about also paying out of savings from day one. Tip number three is establish an emergency fund. If you have an emergency fund, great. You should just double check and make sure that the emergency fund that you have planned also is still relevant and the right amount of money now that you would want. If you don't have an emergency fund, then it's time to set one up. An emergency fund is really just a savings account. Most people have a checking account or some account that handles their day-to-day -day expenses, uh, where their paycheck lands and where their expenses get paid out of. A lot of people also have some sort of a savings account where maybe they will try and put money aside if they're saving up for a new TV or a car or something like that. And then an emergency fund is a separate savings account where you're putting money in and you're not planning on accessing it in case of a dire emergency. This isn't money that you wanna take out and plan to spend on a TV or a car or something else. This is, I've lost my job, my house is destroyed, there's flooding everywhere, and I need money to be able to live for a certain amount of time. I know that not everyone has the means to you know, set up even a savings account, let alone an emergency savings account. So I get that. This is about just kind of letting you know that this sort of a concept exists if you aren't aware of it already. And if you are aware of it, it gets you thinking about ways to save some money to start a, an emergency fund. There are lots and lots and lots of videos on YouTube and blog articles and things of ways to save money or put money aside, even if it's just taking loose change 
every day and putting that aside and that being your emergency fund, having just some money set aside in case of an emergency is going to be better than having nothing set aside. A lot of financial planners will talk about an emergency fund as it relates to the month of expenses that that emergency fund will cover. So some people will have a three month emergency fund. Some people will have a six month emergency fund. And really they're basing that off of the bare minimum monthly expenses that you would need to cover your rent, your utilities, food. There's no entertainment or, or fun in this emergency fund budget. This is a disaster has happened and I need to be able to cover the absolute minimum expenses to be able to survive with my family. The number of months of your emergency fund, again, is really gonna be up to you. Some people are gonna have a difficult time even getting one month of an emergency fund. Some people might just move money and have a 12 month emergency fund off the bat. Everybody's situation is different and I'm not gonna tell you what your situation is. You know your situation and whatever your situation is, that's what you should plan for. What I'm trying to tell you is you should try as much as you can to have an emergency fund so that if a disaster happens, you're not completely flat footed of not having any money available to you to handle that disaster. All right, so that is gonna do it for this week's video, talking about financial preparedness as part of National Preparedness Month. Again, we have three more National Preparedness Month videos that are gonna be coming out in the next three weeks. So make sure that you subscribe and like this video to tell the YouTube algorithm that you would like to know when those videos come out and your friends might wanna know and your family might wanna know. Again, the three tips that we talked about today were cash is king, unless of course there's a global economic meltdown and cash doesn't mean anything and you know. Number two was get disaster insurance or at least talk to your insurance agent about what your disaster insurance could look like in your area for the disasters that you care about. And third is look into starting an emergency fund, whether it's a big emergency fund or a little emergency fund, having some sort of emergency fund is better than no emergency fund. Hopefully these tips are helpful and useful to you as you continue your preparedness journey. Again, if you haven't yet, and I think I've said this already, subscribe, like the video so that you'll be notified. We appreciate growing the community. We appreciate you watching and we will see you next week with a new video. Thanks a lot.